Hello, Oscillator Sync here. A few weeks ago, I put out a set which I wrote and performed on the Electron Digitact, and since putting it out online, I've had a number of people ask me about the process that went into preparing for writing and performing that set. So I figured I'd do a video on just that. So this video will kind of be a combination of tips that I found useful while I was putting the set together, and also kind of just going through the process in general, talking about what worked, what maybe could have gone better. And hopefully they'll answer the questions that those people had and also maybe inspire some new ideas along the way. So with that, let's get to the first tip. So this first tip is probably the most important out of the whole lot. And that is that if you want to put together a set like this, commit to that idea and set some reasonable goals and expectations. So for example, when I decided that I wanted to put this set together, I kind of gave myself some goals and some guidelines for the way I was going to work. So uh, the first one was that I wanted to be done within a month. So from the point where I decided that I was going to actually do this, I knew that in a month's time, my goal was to have it recorded and written and the video put out and the whole lot. Uh, the next thing is that sort of from a, how much music I was going to create, I knew that I wanted to have at least eight patterns. I actually went slightly over that in the end, but that's fine. I, I, I hit my goal. Uh, the other thing that I kind of gave myself were guidelines around how I was going to actually work on it. And uh, my time availability is kind of uh, restricted. I've got a, a young baby in the house. So uh, I knew that I was only going to be able to working on, be working on this um, after they after they'd gone to bed. Uh, I was literally doing it on a uh, ironing board in my room. Um, but what I had kind of put in place for myself as a goal was that if I sat down and was going to be working on something, uh, you know, as long as I wasn't disturbed by sort of childcare duties, uh, I was going to finish a pattern. I was allowed to go back and revisit them, sure, but I wanted to have basically established an entire pattern per session that I had working on it. And that worked out really well for me. I think I reached that goal every single time, a couple of sessions, a couple of evenings, when the inspiration was really flowing, I got through two patterns and stuff. Um, yeah, so setting those goals and those guidelines and actually committing to the idea of, of doing this is super, super important. So the second tip that I'd maybe offer if you're going to try and put together a set like this is try to reduce the number of choices that you are going to have to make about anything other than the actual writing of the music. So one thing that I did that made a massive difference for my workflow is that before I wrote any of the music, I picked out a small subset of samples that I wanted to work with. So I went into the samples menu, I went through all the factory samples, I went through all of the uh, stuff that I had brought in recently, and I went through and I thought, okay, well, I need a selection of kicks, claps, hi-hats, I need some noise, some single cycle waveforms, some other uh, sounds that kind of appeal to me, and I put them in my sample pool before I started writing any music, and my intention was never to go back into picking up samples, because there is nothing that distracts me from making music quite as much as kind of window shopping for presets. It's a complete distraction for me, and you know, you can spend half an hour trying to find a snare drum that's just right, uh, when the one that you've already got there is good enough, and you could be working on the actual music. Um, you can always go back and tweak, I guess, but um, that made a massive difference to me. Actually, as it happens, about two thirds of the way through, maybe three quarters of the way through, I realized that there were some sounds that I definitely wanted that I just didn't have in the sample set. So I did go back there, you know, um, needless consistency is the hobgobbling of a feeble mind. Uh, and you don't want to have to um, restrict yourself dogmatically, but kind of setting up that framework where I didn't have to make any of those choices really meant that every time I sat down to work on the set, I was only working on the music for the set. One of the other ways that I did this, which is kind of a more minor thing, but again, it was just a choice that I didn't have to make. I decided really early on that every pattern was going to be um, four bars long. I didn't have to have that uh, decision. I didn't have to think about, oh, am I going to have to be clever with using conditional tricks to make it feel like it's four bars long when it's not four bars long. No, I just had four bars long. Every single pattern is four bars long. Didn't have to think about it. It was just another choice that I didn't have to think about and I could just concentrate on the music. That approach really works well in the door as well, actually, as it happens. I know that Jeremy from Red Wings Recording has mentioned this a couple of times. Um, around how he has kind of templates set up ahead of time uh, in Ableton so that the stuff that he usually grabs for and stuff that he knows works are just, just kind of there for any particular type of session. And it just means, again, that you're not having to make choices that aren't about the actual writing music. You can always go back and tweak sounds at the end, but you know, while that inspiration is flowing, don't 
do things that are going to interrupt that flow, uh, like trying to pick out the right hi-hat sound. Okay, let's get on to actually talking about writing the patterns themselves. I don't really want to talk too much about the sort of ins and outs of, of you know, conditional tricks and, and uh, note repeats and, and that kind of thing. There are a couple of tricks that I used fairly consistently, which I am going to talk about in a couple of other videos for the Dig Attack coming up fairly soon. What I want to talk sort of more broadly about was the, the workflow as I was putting the uh, music together. So I guess probably the, the thing that I did most consistently while I was um, putting this stuff together is that I wrote all of the patterns in the set in the order that they were then performed in. And one of the things that I decided early on that I wanted to do was always have an element from the previous pattern in the next pattern, which kind of creates a continuity around what you're doing. So um, for example, once I had finished uh, this one here, What I would do is I would go into pattern and copy it, and then I would take uh, that pattern and paste it onto the next one along. So now pattern two is the same as, pa as pattern one. And then I would decide, okay, well, what is the element which is sort of really important to me in terms of uh, what's gonna go into the next uh, track? So it might have been in this case, uh, on. It's fine. Uh, so it might be in this case that the uh, shaker that's on six, I decided was like, that was the signature sound that was going to go into the next um, pattern. So I would mute off everything else and then I would start building the track back up from, from scratch. So I, you know, I would go into uh, one of the tracks and I would uh, clear that track off and I would delete everything that was on it as well until I had an empty track and then I would start thinking, okay, well, perhaps this one's going to be a four to the floor kick here. And maybe it's not going to be the same kick sound. So I you know, go in and find a new kick sound uh, and so on. Make sure it's actually muted as well. So and I'd start building up with this initial sound that was still kind of in there. <sighs> to be honest, I'm not entirely convinced of how much that added to the continuity of the set. I think on some patterns it definitely did, but I think in other places um, it was maybe just a, a thing that I was doing because I decided I was doing it. And as I said, that's kind of valuable anyway because it was a choice that I wasn't having to make. You know, my workflow was always this. The next pattern is based off the previous one uh, by at least one element. Uh, the other benefit. I don't know whether it's a benefit, but certainly a side effect of working that way is that I didn't have to go through and set up my reverb and delay to be the same as the previous thing. That certainly, kind of, that kind of acoustic space element to things, I think probably did add a consistency across the set, even if having um, something from the previous, um, previous pattern in that set did. Um, one other thing that I would say, if you're going to work this way, and probably in general if you're doing a set like this, um, uh, is that you want to be going back occasionally and checking the sort of overall perceived levels of your patterns. Certainly as um, I'd got to sort of pattern six, seven, eight, nine, uh, when I went back, I'd realized that I'd let the volume um, creep up quite a lot. And that meant I was also hitting the uh, compressor a lot harder, uh, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but it was kind of changing the way that things were feeling. Um, one other tip, um, given that uh, way of working, is that there's no point adjusting the track volumes. You want to just set those to a reasonable level and you want to then be doing things, if you want to rebalance things between patterns, you want to be doing that from the amp page rather than using the track. Um, that is if you're not going to be moving that during the actual performance. So anyway, then I wrote the patterns. And once I'd written the patterns, I needed to work out how I was going to perform them. And that's when making notes came into uh, to the whole situation. So um, I, th I created this system here. It's probably completely cryptic. Uh, but I went through and I jammed the, um, the patterns for a while and to work out 
kind of what worked together, you know, what things should be brought in together, what things should I avoid bringing in together, what situations should I um, avoid dropping down to. So I know that one of these uh, one of these pieces of paper somewhere it says do not here we go do not drop to drums and bass because on pattern four dropping to just drums and bass sounded lame and I didn't want to um, make it sound lame. The other thing that I ended up having to do. Um, because I think probably as a side effect of bringing one pattern into the next and working that way is that I ended up with a situation where I had stuff all over the tracks. Uh, the only consistency really is that the kick was always on one, thank God. Uh, that was something that I, I did make sure that I did. But for example here, the snare is on two where it kind of should be and then three here isn't toms, it should says toms on the on the actual uh, digitat, it's not, it was kind of a poppy melody and then the two different kinds of melody here one on the bass and the lead one four and five which is where clap and cowbell should be yeah but essentially i ended up with a kind of a mess um so this uh, sort of note taking system allowed me to remember what was on all of the um all of the actual uh tracks as i went along one other thing that this kind of highlighted to me as i was kind of jamming the tracks and making notes was that there were very few times where actually I wanted every single track on at once. Some of the earlier uh, patterns, which were a bit more sparse, yeah, but you know, often actually having everything on at once, kind of, you think it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but actually it just ended up being kind of messy, which didn't really work out so well. So uh, that was also kind of a way of keeping track of what was going on here. But probably the most uh, important thing, if you can see, every track has got a line, well, sorry, every pattern, some of the tracks have got a line above and some of them have got a line underneath this was my way of specifying what tracks should be turned on when we started this pattern and what tracks should be turned on as we transitioned into the next pattern um, you know what happened within the patterns in terms of turning on the mutes and stuff uh, as I was performing it that was kind of improvised you know I had notes on what I should and shouldn't do and there was some guidance about what should come in first and stuff but it, it, it was kind of improvised but where I started and where I ended was super super important to me and to that end if the camera wants to catch up there we go um, probably the most important thing that I did was before I went and performed is that I went into this mute mode here uh, so shift and then bank twice the purple mute mode so this is the pattern mutes and what the pattern mutes is uh, is the green mutes um, Green mutes here, if you change to a different pattern, these mutes will still be the mutes that are active on that pattern. Whereas the purple mutes are only for this particular pattern that you're on at the moment. And if you move to um, another pattern, you will have uh, different mutes set up on all of them. So what I did before I started the actual performance or the uh, takes for the performance is that I went through and I set up all of our start points. Um, for each of the patterns and then I saved that into the project so that if I perform did a performance where it all went wrong um, I could just reload the project and I have my initial start points for the set already in there. That was super super useful and such a time saver um, when I had to restart uh, a couple of times. So at this point we've uh, set up our creative process so that we can write uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, we've made the notes so that we know how our performance is going to go. We've practiced a little bit probably not as much as we should have done perhaps and we've come to the actual uh, time of recording the performance um, probably the biggest piece of advice that I could give you for that is that you need to reconcile the midpoint at which your requirement for perfection meets the audience's perception of a good performance because um, one thing that I found when I was trying to practice is that I was sat basically going over the first two patterns over and over again because there was always something that wasn't quite right or I didn't do the transition quite right or I hadn't brought stuff in early enough and that meant that when I was practicing I was basically just spending uh, hours going between these first two patterns and never really looking at the other patterns and if that was the approach that I had taken when it came to actually record I probably never would have put this out because I would have ended up hating the entire process so what I'm trying to say here is that if you are doing a live performance on a synth on a groove box it is a live performance and a live performance is not perfect 
there will be things that go wrong. There are three things in the recorded version of the set that are definitely, as far as I'm concerned, wrong. The first two happened fairly early on, and they were kind of like, as I did them, I was like, no, uh, th that's probably fine. It's close enough for jazz kind of situation. Uh, and I kind of just carried on. The third thing that went wrong happened quite a long way in, maybe on pattern nine or something. Um, when it happened, I had a panic actually and, and probably made it worse um, initially. But then I made the assessment that no, I'm most of the way through the set. The rest of the set has been good. I don't want to restart now because it's just going to bum me out. And I then went on to quickly follow uh, some advice that Prince had about uh, making mistakes in music. And what Prince said is that if you make a mistake while you're playing, do the same thing again so that the mistake seemed like it was intentional, which is what I did. You can see if you can watch back and see where I do it. Um, hopefully you can't spot it. That's kind of the point of the tip. Um, but yeah, don't sweat the performance to the point where you end up hating the entire process you know you need to be vibing off it it needs to be feeling good for you if you make a massive cock up then sure stop because you don't want to have something that's that's bad but minor little imperfections that is what live music is it's never perfect so don't expect it to be okay we've kind of come to the end here and there's just time for one more piece of advice and that piece of advice is to go out and buy some cheap table lamps. There's a hair there. Some cheap table lamps and some RGB lights because that made the performance loads better. Yay. Um, these ones I got, the, the lamps I got from, from Asda and they were cheap and the RGB, oh, they create ground loops, which is good. Uh, and the RGB uh, lights were like five pound for two off, off Amazon or something. Totally worth it. Everyone should have them for all of their electronic music videos uh, because they're ace, very cheap, very vibey, and certainly made the recording process uh, more fun. The room was nice and dark, and uh, and the the lights were vibing, and, and so was I. So anyway, I hope that was useful, and if it wasn't useful, at least it was interesting. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please do hit the thumbs up, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel because there will be more Digitech stuff coming up fairly, fairly soon. Um, I've got um, a couple of ideas of stuff that I definitely want to cover. Some of it uh, actually is related to the set as well, and some other stuff as well. Uh, and general synth stuff, of course, if you're into synth, then we've got lots of synth stuff happening on the channel at all times. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.